All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So our next speaker is Evelyn Cordner from Strava. She's a stock trader turned engineer. So her background is in iOS development and she currently leads the growth engineering team at Strava. So please join me in welcoming Evelyn to the stage um, where she's gonna discuss Strava as a lean mean testing machine. Thanks, Stephanie. Is this on? Okay, great. Hi, uh, good afternoon everybody, thanks for coming. My name is Evelyn Cordner, and uh, I'm the lead, lead engineer and manager for Strava's growth team. And true to the engineering stereotype, I'm not one that typically jumps at the opportunity to speak in front of an audience. But Optimize asked me to be here today, and we at Strava love Optimize, so here I am. Before we start, I'd love to get a quick pulse check on the audience. Can any engineers raise your hands? All right, we've got a couple, not bad. What about product managers? Good. Data scientists? Awesome. Did anybody just come here today because they love Strava? Awesome. <laughs> if we have time at the end, I'll open it up for future requests. When I first started on the growth team in January, we were launching about three A-B tests a quarter. By about midway through the year, we were launching over 30 A-B tests a quarter. Today, I'm going to talk about how we turn Strava's growth team into a lean, mean testing machine. All right, so our agenda for today's talk, I'll start with an introduction to our growth team, and then I'm gonna talk about why we love experimentation. Given that we're at an A-B testing conference, I'm hoping that we'll get a lot of alignment on this topic. And then I'm gonna go through three processes that we iterated on at Strava in order to enable rapid development. And these are analytics, mobile release cadence, and experimental code. All right, so let's dive into our growth team. Our growth team's north star is Mao, or monthly active users. But if any of you out there have tried to work with Mao as a KPI, you know that this behemoth of a number is very difficult to move. So our growth team tracks three of our key inputs into Mao. Mao is equal to Mao yesterday, so users that were active yesterday, plus any new users who have registered for our platform, plus Winback, these are people who were inactive who are now active again, and minus churn. So these are people who were active who are now inactive. Our growth marketing team is focused on new users. They do this primarily through organic loops, SEO, and paid acquisition. Our re-engagement team is focused on win back. They try to bring people back to the Strava platform, mostly through push notifications and email. And finally, our activation team is focused on reducing churn. I'm gonna come back to activation in a little bit. First, I wanna give a quick snapshot of what our growth team looks like. We have two Android engineers and two iOS engineers who are primarily focused on activation. And then we have three full-time web engineers who are split between the three different initiatives. We also have a dedicated web engineer on our re-engagement team and a dedicated web engineer on our growth marketing team. All right, back to activation. An activated user is one who has uploaded an activity to the Strava platform and followed in their first seven days. So I'm gonna go through the two main reasons why we like activation. The first is that if you upload an activity to Strava's platform, we know you understand the value of tracking your athletic life on Strava. If you follow somebody, we know you understand the value of being a part of our community. So an activated user is one who understands the value of Strava. The second reason why we like activation is because if you're an activated user, you're three times as likely to still be on the Strava platform six months later. Higher activation rate equals more retention equals lower churn. What this means is that we on the growth team who are focused on an athlete's first seven days on Strava are advocating for the new members of our community. Yet we ourselves are no longer new to the platform. To make sure we are effectively serving our athletes, we need to avoid making assumptions and instead use data to drive decisions. We do this primarily through A-B testing. A-B testing is the backbone to our growth team. Beyond helping us to gain a better understanding of our athletes, it allows us to quantify the impact, impacts of our projects, it enables decisive decision making, it limits debate and speculation, 
and it prevents us from making changes that negatively affect our KPIs. Each hypothesis that is either proven or disproven by an A-B test has an immediate impact on our team's roadmap. The more we A-B test, the more we learn, and the bigger an impact we can have. So enabling our growth team to run more A-B tests was about a lot more than just adding new engineers to the team, although that certainly helped. What we had to do was take a look at the process from an idea for an A-B test to a completed test and find ways that we could streamline this process. And we identified three key areas. The first is analytics. Basically, we lacked a way to simply add analytics alongside our A-B tests. The second was our release cycle. Our release cycle. We need to be able to get our A-B tests in the hands of users as fast as possible. And lastly, we took a look at the code that is supporting our A-B tests. So let's dive into analytics. The problem we found here was pretty easy to see. The overhead for adding analytics to our A-B tests was oftentimes more complex, to, more complex than building the tests themselves. So a little bit of background on this. Last year, we launched, we launched an analytics system with the goal of instrumenting our feed. The feed is the place you go on Strava to see your friends' activities, posts, etc. We wanted to know what users were doing in the feed, what stories they were looking at, what stories they were engaging with, what stories they weren't engaging with, how much time they were spending, etc. What this necessitated was an analytics platform that could ensure cross-platform consistency, and also that would be robust against any future visual changes to the feed. What this resulted in was a protobuf-driven proto analytics where we have a centralized schema defined define in our repository and shared between all of our client repositories. What this looked like in practice was that every time we wanted to add a new analytics event to our analytics system, we not only had to gain agreement around what the schema updates would look, at, look like, but we had to make changes in six repositories and have over nine pull requests. So while this system was really great for tracking all of the data we need to know around how a user interacts with the, with the feed, it was not good for A-B testing. A-B tested, A-B tests don't have to ensure cross-platform consistency because we often run them on only one platform, or at least we analyze them on a per-platform basis. Additionally, they don't need to be around for the long haul. So the solution we came up with here was to leverage a third-party service for measuring our A-B tests. So we were already using Optimize for its cohorting capabilities. What we hadn't taken advantage of was the suite of tools that it provides for measuring A-B tests. And I'm going to go through some of the pros and cons we found to using Optimize Analytics. The first is that they were super easy to use. Since we'd already integrated the SDK into our mobile apps, all we had to do was import the library into the file where we need it and add this simple line of code. Optimize also has codeless events, and these can be used for simple things like but button clicks or page views. The data visualization was an added bonus because it allowed engineers to understand the state of their experiments easily, reducing the strain on our data scientists. And finally, Optimize Analytics came at no additional cost because we were already subscribing. It's worth noting some of the downsides to using Optimize as well. As with any third-party service, when issues arise, it's difficult and time-consuming to debug. We found it hard to coordinate the data between the two different analytics platforms, both our own and Optimize's. And finally, Optimize doesn't have any analytics outside of the context of an experiment. So establishing baselines or monitoring trends over time was difficult. In the long run, we'd love to see Strava develop a system internally that is as easy to use and loosely typed, just like Optimize. But this would give us full control over the data pipeline so that we could run analysis across both data systems. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is our mobile release cycle, what we call cadence. The problem we had here was that our mobile release cycle required two to four weeks of wait time from a code complete test to launching that test to users. So first I'll explain a little bit about our cadence and why that wait time exists. And then I'll explain why this is a problem for A-B testing. So at Strava, we launch a new version of our mobile apps every two weeks. Before any version gets launched, it undergoes two weeks of external beta testing. 
So every two weeks, a branch is cut off of master, and that branch becomes our release branch. In an effort to make the release branch as stable and bug-free as possible, once it's cut off of master, we limit any code changes into the release branch. What this means is that if we want to merge an A-B test, say the day after a train is cut, it would ship four weeks later. So why is this a problem for A-B tests? Let's consider the A-B test lifecycle. And for this example, let's say we're doing a small experiment like changing the color of a button. It might take us one day for our designers to come up with specs. It then might take us another day for our engineers to build and, build and merge the code. According to our release cycle, it then takes us two to four weeks to QA the test and ship it. Most of our experiments take two weeks to collect data. The reason why we like two weeks is that there's a really big difference between how people use Strava on a Sunday versus, say, a Tuesday. So this allows us to remove that day of the week bias. And then finally, it might take us a day to analyze the results and decide on the next steps. So let's consider a situation where we, we want to run five A-B tests, where each test depends on the success or failure of the prior test. Given that this cycle takes four to six weeks, those five tests would take us two quarters. So if we as a growth team want to be running a lot of tests in a single quarter, we need to run them on different parts of the app and targeting different metrics. If we could instead cut this cycle down and make it, say, half as, half as long, then we could run a lot of tests that are focus tests on similar parts of the app. More focus allows the team to maintain momentum, it reduces mental strain, and thus allows us to run even more A-B tests. So the solution we came up with here was to allow A-B tests to be merged directly into our release branch. What this looks like is code that is merged, say, the day after a train is cut. Instead of shipping four weeks later, it ships two weeks later. Now, the downside to this approach is that our A-B tests aren't undergoing the same rigorous QA cycle that the rest of our release branch is. A couple of the, a couple of the things we've done to mitigate this risk is that everything must be guarded by a feature switch or optimize experiment. This is so that we can turn off the A-B test without needing to deploy any additional code. We use our best judgment. Small A-B tests are fine to go into the release branch. Big new user experiences should probably stay in master so that they can undergo the full QA cycle. We need to be mindful of translations, which take time to turn around. And finally, we establish the risk budget working group, which monitors the stability of our app. And I'm going to come back to the risk budget working group in detail at the end of the presentation. Our long-term vision for Strava is to move from a two-week release cadence to a one-week cadence. We only know of a couple companies out there that are doing a one-week release cadence, so we're pretty excited to push the envelope. All right, so experimental code. This is the term we've coined internally to refer to code that is backing an A-B test. The problem we had here was that we were wasting engineering time polishing code that is removed if an A-B test fails. So in a little bit more detail, Strava's engineering culture is pretty rigorous. Our mobile code base is certainly not small. It's over six years old, and we have 12 engineers working on each platform. Almost all of the features that we've built for Strava remain in production today. Our engineering culture, which is so strongly rooted in the need to build features that last, seeks us to look for refactored and reusable code in every pull request. A-B tests, on the other hand, don't need to stick around for the long haul. And it is the nature of A-B tests such that at the end of the experiment, one, one version succeeds and the other version fails. As the growth team pushes the envelope of A-B testing, taking bigger product risks, we're going to encounter more tests that fail. And when those tests do fail, the time that we spent polishing and refactoring the code supporting them is wasted when all of that code gets deleted. So what did we do here? We redefined code standards for experimental code. As an engineer building an A-B test, I should feel free to take any shortcuts necessary to get this test into the hands of users as fast as possible. As a reviewer of experimental code, rather than being concerned with the reusability and the, and the perfection of the code, 
I should only care that the code works, that it is isolated by a feature switch, again, so it can be turned off if any issues arise. The code must not crash the mobile applications or the website. And the code must have an associated JIRA ticket with a deadline for its removal. At the end of an experiment, our experimental code needs to either be deleted or upgraded to meet our style guidelines, coding best practices, and aptly refactored. A coworker shared a quote with me that I think is pretty perfect for this part of the presentation. Duplication is far cheaper than the wrong abstraction. Now, all of you rigorous engineers out there might be shaking in your boots at the thought of all this hacky, hacky duplicated code entering your code base. Well, we were too, and that's why we established the Risk Budget Working Group. The Risk Budget Working Group is still relatively new to Strava. It's a cross-functional team consisting of engineers from each platform and representatives from our customer support team, our QA team, and our product management team. The Risk Budget Working Group established and maintains two budgets. The first one, the error budget, makes sure that we keep a quality user experience. The error budget constrains how many bad crashes, bugs, we are willing to accommodate in our products. The second budget is the technical debt budget, and this ensures we maintain a quality code base. The technical debt budget constrains how long temporary or experimental code can remain in our code base before it, bu before it must be removed or refactored. If, if either of these budgets are depleted, we must stop adding experimental code until the budget either resets, i.e. at the end of a quarter, or until all of the overdue experimental code has been cleaned up. The Risk Budget Working Group assesses the impact of any bugs or crashes that have come up in our applications or on our website. We do this by looking at a couple things, its effect on the customer support queue, the number of users affected, and whether or not the issue hit a critical flow, such as recording. But the most important thing that the group does is monitors if any of these process changes are causing an increase in bugs and crashes. When a lot of people hear the word budget, they think of something that's restraining. I can only spend this much money. But in practice, budgets are actually enabling. If we set aside money to do something, then we feel free to use it. As long as we stay below our air budgets, then we are free to experiment. So what's next for Strava's growth team? Well, we're pretty good at shipping A-B tests. And all of these processes have allowed us to easy and quickly iterate. We're so good at shipping A-B tests, in fact, that the next roadblock we fit we've hit is one that's pretty difficult to remove. Let's consider again the A-B test lifecycle, but this time the biggest component is the two weeks that it takes us to collect data on an experiment. Given that we need to get to statistical significance for our tests, and again we want to account for day of the week bias, this one is pretty hard to move. So what are we doing about it? Well, we're shifting aside our test everything growth culture at least for now. Instead, we're taking bigger risks with bigger tests. We're learning how to prioritize projects that we think will have the highest impact. And we're hoping that these bigger risks come with even bigger learnings. I want to take a second to thank Optimize for hosting me today and all of you for braving the cold to be here. <laughs> if you want to keep up with updates from our engineering team, follow our Strava engineering blog on Medium. If you want to discuss any of these topics in more detail, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, and I'd be happy to set up a call or go grab a coffee. And you can also follow me on Strava. And I'll leave this up here while I open the floor to any other questions. I think there was a, a question in the back. I don't, not sure. Yeah, go ahead and then we'll get to the Slido. Mm -hmm. 
So the question is, how do we deal with A-B testing on top of code refactors? And I think the most important thing to do there is communication. And also, a lot of times, we will maybe set aside A-B tests. For example, we just launched a new version of our feed. So for a while, we had to be really careful with A-B tests that we were making in our feed, that they would be supported by the new feed, and also that they would work while the feed was under a refactor. Does that answer your question? Awesome. So kind of going along with that, um, top voted question is, do your growth tests ever step on other product teams, and how do you handle that? Yeah, again, communication is the most important thing, and I think having the whole team and the whole culture aligned around A-B testing really helps. Um, but we on the growth team, we know that we need to prioritize the projects that we think will have the highest impact, and other teams also respect that as well. Um, so there is no toe-stepping, there's no sacred cows at Strava, there's no hard lines of where we can and can't make changes, and I think that's really important culture for every growth team to have. Awesome. Um, how do you figure out which web features to bring to mobile? And then also as a side note, we have please bring grade adjusted pace and manual elevation <laughs> entry to mobile. <laughs> All right, noted. How do we decide what web features to bring to mobile? So I think the all these ideas around what web features should go on mobile undergo the same prioritization of any other ideas we have. I don't think we prioritize bringing web features to mobile just because we want to have parity between our web app and our mobile apps. Uh, we want to, again, prioritize on mobile the projects that we think will have the highest impact and bring the most value to our users. Awesome. Um, let's do one more. What is your favorite experiment? What is my favorite experiment? <laughs> Team Strava up here is laughing in the front. Um, well, we did one recently that was really successful, so I'll talk about that. If anyone's used our Strava record screen, uh, you know that we use symbols for the record button for start and stop. And those symbols we thought could maybe be a little confusing. Um, so this is a theme that we've had in a lot of our tests, but replacing icons with text to make actions much cleaner. Uh, we've seen big successes on that front. Sorry, can I do one more? There was one that got upvoted, which is why it jumped away from the uh, bottom there. Um, what do you do when you see neutral results in an experiment, and how do you define neutral? That's a great question. Uh, so neutral, I guess, would be not st statistically significant. Um, so similar to Netflix, we have a meeting every week where we discuss the results of our experiments. And depending on whether we think the, the the variant will be a better user experience, whether we think it'll be harder to maintain in terms of a code perspective or a feature perspective. All of things, these things weigh into whether or not we roll that test out or not. Awesome. All right, well, thank you, Evelyn. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Good job.